the bigger muscle of those B-bomb rejects, and that damn scribble pad juicing him full of magic I got no chance against. I got my back to the wall here. I'll do anything to get my table back from those scum dumpsters. I'm your animal spirit guide. You must travel deep into the Deathwind Desert, and all will be revealed. What's Craven and Sean Cunningham? John Parker too? You said John sent you? Said you knew some people who'd be good in the fight and need to make sure I win. Sure, real mean mothers. Tough as they come. No, Mandy, this is bigger than us. Goodbye, dead best. I want to give a shout out to everyone watching out there in the Crosslands. I'm throwing a big time blowout. Why didn't you tell me about this already? Buskill's got something big in motion and we're running out of time. Set up, roll out of here. We'll be the ones laughing when I kick Buskill's ass up and down the Crosslands. Freaks. I would say happy Halloween, but this mischief night's about to get ugly. We're just moments away before my gang and I bring the hurt down on that ass clown Buzzkill and kick him and his monster misfits out of the howl in for good and reclaim my table. We got the muscle, the hardware, Road Rash has come back to me. This is a fight we can't lose. What the fuck? Try your luck at scoring a good time on our merry coaster of giggling mayhem. Whoa, dude! This is the place? You hang out at the circus with the oohs and ahs and the fatty candy apples? Oh, this is the Howlin', but Buzzkill's overhauled it into a carny metropolis. Look at that crowd! <laughs> Great my sarcophagus party. What tarnation's TV money? Dead West. Billy. Who are these people? Oh, they're with me. Why so possessive with a porta john? It was from here I was reborn, and where my strength from my raging tribe ancestors comes from. I have not seen you for some moons now. I've been on the road rallying these guys up to take back the Howlin' from Buzzkill. Oh, yes. The Grease Face Man. He has caused much trouble that has all but brought down the Howlin. All night raves daily pickle fights, and the endless bad dick puns. I would leave, but it is still my quest to dismantle the mega devil bull that dwells inside. This is certainly a new fucking development. I best do some recon before we unleash hell. If you cannot afford Buzzkill seeing you, you'll need my help for getting in undetected. Sounds like a plan to me. And there ain't no faster way in and out than Road Rash. Let's get going. Come on, Billy. Putrid! Polecats! It looks like Bozo and Pee Wee tag team vandalizing in this place! We wanna know where Buzzkill is now! We sick and tired of seeing you through their face all the time! You want to harm a hair on my Prince Jester's head? You'll enjoy Buzzkill's big top Halloween blowout! Or be ushered six feet under for upsetting this joyous occasion! Oh. Mac Machine's working for Buzzkill? He's been hexed with a Technomancer spell that makes him loyal to Buzzkill. Follow me. We found this lost soul who has also been slighted by the evil hands of Dead West. Big buns were only as good as the brick and brat tat song putty tat. I got this, Copperfield. For the last time, it's Rabbit Cadabra! Yowza! You better get that rabbit in your hat under control, buddy. Ugh, now, by the power vested in me by my dead subject notebook, I announce you CURD. Ah, 
where am I? The last thing I remember was a shootout with Dead West. <laughs> I hear he blew your brains right into the wind. That cheating dickweed. If I see him again, I'm gonna break his bones down into toothpicks. I got beef with Boater too. Join my monster misfits, and I'll make sure you get your revenge. Consider me joined. Awesome sauce! Let's get your hazing underway with a pre-show act I got scheduled. Come in close, boys. This is the home stretch. Not too long from now, this melting pot of monsters we're gathered will be called a center ring of this Halloween hoofla, at which point I'm gonna use a little help from old doodle face here to make everyone worship me as their number one go-to host for horror entertainment. <laughs> Ruin! You're my front line in case any trouble pops up, so be on your tippy toes. All party crashers will be executed. It's you and your flying mind control fish are crowd control. That shouldn't be a problem. And Tubanga is my bodyguard because, well, <laughs> I need something big to block any attacks I don't see coming. I never knew he could be capable of such evil. Well, I did, but that's because a stool jerky tipped me off. I wonder why I haven't seen him around. <laughs> Billy! Billy, what is. Son of a bitch! Hey guys! Ebonside, what the fuck are you doing? No, I know you hate Buzzkill, but he knows how to hook a brother up when he's got the munches. What is this about? Ah, Buzzkill put that up. <laughs> it's funny, man. People come in here expecting to see the giant man eating chicken, but instead they get me eating chicken. <laughs> you know, I got the satisfied need for feed, you know what I'm saying? Cooked the best tough as jerky, though. You're eating blood free! Say what? Oh, cats and a floor fan. I've got to bring a bigger gun to this knife fight. What's this? Well, Frankenhooker had one name on her list. She warned me not to call unless it was desperate. He's had a trilogy of movies, so maybe you scream fix heard of him. Let me tell you about one of the weirdest, baddest motherfuckers to tear across a horror genre in the film series. Basket Case. The meat of the story is a guy named Dwayne who crashes in the Big Apple during his rougher days with nothing but the clothes on his back and a basket in his hands has got the whole city asking. What's in the basket? 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 My brother. Your brother! <laughs> You heard right, Scream Freaks. Within the confines of this mobile wicker home hides Dwayne's brother, an angry deformed twin named Belial, who was once Dwayne's Siamese twin attached to his side. After years of their father's bitter resentment toward them for killing their mother at childbirth, the brothers were secretly separated against their will by shady doctors and veterinarians hired to make Dwayne normal and Belial a prompt dumpster oddity. Luckily, Belial is rescued from Garbage Day and quickly repays a favor to dear old dad. They could find no evidence of who killed your father, nor do they have any idea what killed him. I would kind of think the big ass saw would be a dead giveaway for a man cut in half. Taken in by their loving aunt, the traumatized siblings grow up with revenge on the brain and plot to get back at the doctors who tried to kill Belial. While on the hunt in the concrete jungle, however, the brother's gift basket of death plan is threatened when Belial gets increasingly jealous of Dwayne's curiosity for the opposite sex, leaving him sexually frustrated with the most violent case of blue balls I've ever seen. Now, I'm actually hard pressed to find anything sour about this film to bitch about. For this to be writer director Frank Hindenlotter's first major motion picture, he came out of the gate strong. Basket Case is a low budget exploitation film that some may dismiss at first glance for its cheap presentation and less than polished editing, but its story and characters are so fresh and engaging you quickly overlook any such shortcomings and find yourself rooting in Dwayne and Bilal's corner. I'm really impressed with how each character in this film, no matter how big or small a role, came off as a distinct and memorable personality that's totally believable. But maybe that's because we can accept New York is full of weirdos. <laughs> One of the most enduring characters is Casey, the friendly lady of the night across the hall from Dwayne. Exhibiting Pam Greer charisma, she recognizes Dwayne as a fish out of water and warms up to him, which in turn charms the audience into connecting with Dwayne through insightful moments they share outside the revenge story. Casey was masterfully played by actress comedian Beverly Bonner and apparently made such a positive impression on Hen and Lauder that she's brought back for a cameo in the rest of his filmography, which includes the earlier reviewed Frankenhooker. Checking what the pissing timer is, we do unfortunately have about a minute and a half pissing time, but it's all at once in the flashback, which helps us forgive it all the quicker. And luckily for us, there's no focus scares attempted in this film, so you don't have to worry about anything that's not an actual monster trying to scare you. Shifting our attention to the sweets of the film, it can be summed up in one word, Belial. Much like other under-celebrated monster superstars like Maniac Cop, Belial is this larger-than-life monster with a whole trilogy under his belt, but not everyone's heard of him, and that sucks! This guy has all the ingredients for a successful monster. He's got the tragic backstory, an iconic grotesque look complete with powerful chompers, and freakish powers that make him anything but laughable. Though unless he's throwing the world's biggest temper tantrum like a retarded whirlwind. Oh, 
Aside from his gorilla strength and ability to squeeze in the small toilets, Bilal also shares a psychic link with his brother Dwayne. It used to be a two-way mental highway when they were still connected, but after their separation, only Bilal can go back and forth into their noggins, which gives Dwayne very little relief. For Christ's sake, shut up and let me get some sleep! It's even worse when they finish their hit list and Dwayne gets to thinking about the ladies which throws Belial into a sexual overdrive. Jealous as he can't get a woman as easily as his brother, Belial decides to grab life by the boobs and sets on all kinds of kinky adventures from panty rays to surprise sex parties. Still alone and frustrated in the end, however, Belial becomes the ultimate dick as the cock block of horror when he decides Dwayne can't enjoy women if he can't. Just like women to tear bros apart, these two end up fighting their disagreement out to a bitter end with Belial showing Dwayne's new girlfriend the literal meaning of orgasm, the little death. In this case, or basket case, a blood gushing rape. Leading us into the kill count, basket case stacks up five to six bodies. I say five to six because the battle with the head doctor of their separation, Dr. Cutter, get it, Dr. Cutter, is a tricky one to call. Belial freaks out on her, impels her face full of scalpels, but she's never actually seen dying. I mean, somebody could potentially survive this, you know? And if there wasn't another two sequels, we would count Dwayne and Belial fighting out the window to their death, but we know they live to see more adventures. And Hennenlauter continues to knock him down. We not only have zero pissing time and bogus scares, but we get boobs as well. Oh, wait, I forgot Hennenlauter decided to throw in Dwayne streaking in his dream for some artsy, risque reason. Billy, let's nuke the ingredients of this ugly duckling golden egg and see what it rates. I highly recommend this 80s schlockbuster to any and all B-movie horror fans. It's gritty, bloody, sexually charged, just the way we like it. But what do I know? Well, I kill the tomato movies. Rex Labs. Rex is dead, Wes. I need a huge favor. Get it, wait. I'm about to test an anti-corrosion formula on my robot before he falls apart. I forget that. Robots don't have souls. I need you to snag a Siamese tumor twin named Belial and bring him to Howlin. He's probably going to be resistant, which is why I need that big brain of yours to figure out a way to get him here. I do have a new tranquilizer net I've been wanting to test. Well, here's a chance. Now take down this address. Uh -huh. Got it. Be there as soon as I can. Sorry, Emotibot. It'll have to wait. It's done. I think it would be wise for us to return to the others now before they worry. Well, we're on the same page. Come on, Ebenstein. Man, I can't believe I was tricked into eating turkey man meat. Are you gonna stop eating it anytime soon? Monkey! Son of a bitch! We can't let him tell Busk over here! Do not shoot! That is a sure way to be found out. <laughs> Great job, Billy! Come here, curious tattletale. I know just what you need. About time you invited me to the fiesta! Round the world, Tequila Worm! Now! You hear something? Well, that bought us some time, but we need to hurry. While we race back to the others, let me review the next Basket Case movie for you screen freaks. Basket Case 2. The meat of this left turn sequel is the return of Dwayne and Belial after surviving their race to kiss the pavement at the end of the first movie, where most viewers wrote them off for dead. Now that the world knows who they are, their story makes national headlines as the killer freak twins that terrorize New York, and everyone in the media wants a piece of them. Laid up in the hospital under police custody, Belial and worse for wear Dwayne are fast to make a run for it, but are intercepted in the parking lot by Granny Ruth, a woman the tabloids call Dr. Freak. She knew the brother's aunt who raised them and offered them sanctuary at her home for unique individuals. With nowhere else to go, the brother's freak accept her offer and join her community of the physically afflicted, hiding from the world's harsh fear of them. For a while, everything's on the up and up. Granny Ruth becomes Belial's therapist. Ripping the faces off people may not be in your best interest. And introduces him to a reclusive female in the house who looks a little too similar for comfort. Dwayne heals up fine and even contemplates leaving Belial with her new family to pursue a normal life, hopefully with Granny's granddaughter Susan. In the meantime, a Snoopy rag reporter has been hot on the brother's trail since her escape and finds her big break when she sees him at Granny Roof's. Putting career-changing bylines before notifying the authorities, the reporter quickly sets out to write her story which puts the freak's peaceful seclusion at risk. Do we flee? Feeling responsible for the trouble they have brought, Dwayne knows Ronnie won't ensure the freak's safety and stays to help them stop the reporter from exposing them all. 
Sampling the sours of the sequel, it's definitely a step up from the first movie, production-wise, but it does lose a little of that gritty, independent energy as a result. The brothers have been displaced from the grimy streets of New York and relocated to a more of a suburban setting where Granny Roof's house resides, full of these cartoony-looking doodles of freaks. It's a sequel, so the more the merrier, right? I appreciate makeup artist Gabe Bartolo's ambition for creating a small army of original creations, but so many of them look like aliens or actual creatures as opposed to people with unfortunate genetic handicaps. But who says it can't be that, you know? Maybe this world Dwayne and Belial occupy is mutants and superheroes and other crazy comic book walks of life all over the place, and these people happen to fall into those categories. I mean, come on! An actual frogman and gargoyle? Accepting all this, I still think three things could have improved the overall presentation of these characters. I understand they're more or less background characters, but we could have had more variations of the different paint jobs. They all look so dull and toned down, which again, might be because they're background characters, but let's stylize them some more. They, they could also stand to be more expressive. Nearly all of them have these permanently baked in expressions in her faces that may as well have been pulled down Halloween masks. And finally, I think it would have greatly benefited the movie more if these guys could actually talk. I mean, a couple do, but the rest of them just grunt, mutter, and moan. I just feel like this was a lot of missed opportunity for giving us something more dynamic that could have given the movie more depth. I mean, just look to the X-Men, for example. Hell, at least let these guys do something more than just shuffle around. I know Belial's a star, but if they're all serious about protecting their home, you would think they would at least hold the guy Belial's tearing into, you know? The one time I felt they really worked as an imposing group was after Belial disposes of the reporter's photographer, and she sends an old cop buddy to rescue him. Meeting with Dwayne in what's assumed to be a neutral location, Location, the cop has the tables flipped on him as the patrons eerily reveal themselves to be the freaks in oh so clever disguises. Now if you count flashbacks, then this does clock around a little more than a minute and a half of pissing time, which isn't too bad, but still could have done without a lot of needless walking and wandering for building suspense. But Hey, at least we don't have any bogus scares to annoy us. The biggest sweet last movie was Belial, and with a bigger budget, he's looking better than ever. Evolving from hand puppets and stop motion, the filmmakers now look like they have the opportunity to work with mechanical puppeteering, and even experiment with this one and only shot of the actor playing Dwayne portraying Belial, which looks ten kinds of awkward. A bigger budget sequel also meant more freaks for your sweaty buck, and despite what I found wrong with them, I thought this was a good direction to take the series. Everything that happened in the first movie has now been flipped around. Unlike last time, Belial now has a female who doesn't go hysterical at the side of him. In fact, they get along so well, they, well, yeah. From that angle, he finger snatches in her hip. So in a surprise turn of events, Dwayne is the one who can't get a girl for jumpstarting a normal life, and gets insanely jealous of his brother finding happiness after the cock block he's been to him for most of his life. Nothing a bat to the face and a sewing needle to the side can't fix. As much as I like this whole plot with Granny Ruth, I still think it should have ended differently with her dying one way or another. Whether by accident or because it turned out she was a horrible person mistreating the freaks like in most of these kind of stories, I think her death would have left viewers on more of a cliffhanger and keep the all-important spotlight in Dwayne and Bilal as likely can for becoming the house's newest leaders after proving themselves against a reporter. Speaking of which, she's dealt with with a scene right out of the classic film Freaks, but with possibly a far more disturbing end where Belial disfigures her as though her face were made of Play-Doh. Gleefully looking over the kill count, Basket Case 2 stacks up seven bodies. A cool five of these belong to Belial, but surprisingly the last two belong to Dwayne. After everyone threatening the freak's way of life is taken out, Dwayne feels his debt to the house is settled, and he's ready to bug out but not without Granny Ruth's granddaughter Susan. Refusing to leave, she reminds Dwayne she's been saying she's a freak this whole time, and finally shows him how. I'm pregnant. I've been pregnant for the past six years. What? We try to take him out, but he doesn't want to leave. So Granny has been taking care of me until he's ready to be born. He's not dangerous. He he just needs to come up for air sometimes. And you thought finding out your girlfriend had herpes was bad. Now we do get to see a little of Susan's talent before she takes a prego swan dive, but barely. You have to freeze frame it. For a fan of exploitive films, you're slipping in the modern. And once again, the actor playing Dwayne dares to bear to the basket case series, swooning ladies into a full moon. Billy, let's nick the ingredients of this monster mash of a sequel and see what it rates. a little from the awesomeness that was the first part, this parade of horribles was a valiant effort in continuing the basket case story, but needed a couple more left turns to shake things up, and more thought should have been given to the newer characters serving as the story's motivation. I'd recommend Basket Case 2 to the fans of the first film, people who chuckle at monster porn, and those who are still on the fence if they want to be a reporter for a career. But what do I know? I like killers made of movies. Alright, this is it everyone. Everything we've been working toward has culminated in this moment. Now in the beginning, this was about a bet and a table that I was willing to jeopardize your lives over in the name of pride and vanity, and that cost me along the way. 
but this has escalated into something way bigger than all of us. Whether you're here as a favor or because you're honoring your word in a better trade, by some ridiculous play orchestrated by the cosmos, we've become the Crossland's last hope for stopping a total mindfuck takeover. Buskill's gone fame power hungry with that secondhand spell book he has, and plans on dropping a mother of a spell on the Halloween party down there that'll have everyone kneeling at his big floppy boots and worship him as a celebrity god. Now with the additional help of misfit monsters who are still adding to their numbers, we have ourselves a hell of a monster brawl we're heading into. Some of you may not live to see your next Halloween. I am okay with being a brainwashed slave. Better than being dead. Slavery is not an option, so no more live like that from you spineless yellow bellies. You are lucky enough to be standing among some of the toughest sons of bitches from here to the Twin Moons. When the going gets tough, all we know to do is curb stuff its face and then make it watch us defile everything it holds dear. We're the strongest, meanest, and by my guess, craziest bastards anyone would ever want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, and that's what we're going to prove here today. Before we charge a howl in, I recommend all of you take a moment for yourselves and make peace with anything you maybe have left in the basement. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Billy. Well, Scream Freaks, how about we have one last review in case it's our last? Let's get some adrenaline going and get mad as we talk about Basket Case 3. The meat of the second sequel isn't at all what you would expect. Months have passed since we last saw Dwayne rejoin with Belial after Susan's accidental death, and some interesting things have been baking in the oven. Waking up from a catatonic state as a result of his psychotic episode, Dwayne learns Belial's fleshy lump of girlfriend Eve is pregnant with his kids. Given Eve's irregular physiology, Granny Roof loads up the freaks and heads to Florida where a trusted doctor can help with the birth. Still a sly short of a full pie, Dwayne continues working through some nutty separation anxiety and panics at the thought of Belial's new family coming between them. This sends some running to the authorities in an effort to be arrested with Belial so they can stay together in prison. Realizing the brothers had a million dollar reward in their heads, which is actually a sham made up by the paper the reporter worked for in the last movie, the police race to where the gang's holding up and prove the South and freaks don't mix when they accidentally kill Eve and kidnap the newborn munchers for Belial bait. Once again, the family has been threatened and Granny Roof leads the charge to rescue the babies and exact revenge for Eve's murder. Well, let's go ahead and get the biggest complaint out there as we look at the sour parts of this silly sequel. Granny Roof is the star of this adventure. Was she not a strong enough character to carry movie? Well, no, she could be a horror icon in her own right, but we popped this sucker in the player for Dwayne and Belial, not the mother goose of unmen. Cause you've got The fans on the bus go, fuck my life, fuck this shit, who came up with this? Seriously, the brothers freak really just take a back seat for the majority of this film while Granny Root plays ringleader for the chaos created by Belial's sex romp last movie. Quite literally, Dwayne and Belial have almost become minor characters in this. Don't get me wrong, they're the reason we even have a story, but we're following Granny Roof cleaning up their mess most of the movie, treating the stars as just any other freak in the family she's rounded up and is clearly dominant over. Even the fucking ending to this movie, which is also the ending to the trilogy, is Granny Roof's mug preaching at the viewer with threats against anyone foolish enough to mess with anyone who was different. Granny Roof stole the movie even more when we dive into her backstory as a caretaker to the odd and different with this whole trip south to her doctor friend's home. It was mentioned she had a son who was a freak in the last movie, and this sequel reveals he was alive and hiding out here for several years. What the fuck? I'm at a complete loss for words. This is what they came up with when designing a seven-armed man? This has zero imagination to it and actually makes my head hurt to understand. It's almost like they weren't even trying. He's just a blob of seven arms randomly stuck on. I'm sure the local sheriff shares my sentiments. He's known little Hal for seven years as a seven-armed wonder kid who could build gadgets as if P.B. Herman and Ernest P. Wuerl shared a brain, but he never sees him in person until investigating Dwayne's report of Belial and his own officer's basket napping. He must have had something far less amorphous in mind. Speaking of Little Hal's makeup effects, the same gang is back from the last part with pretty much the same non-speaking static faces. Putrid polecats! Look at the edges on that makeup! What? Well, why did they do that? But back to the whole Granny Roof thing, this is why I think she should have died the last movie. I seriously think this story could have been so much better to watch if it either took Dwayne and Bilal completely away from the whole Granny Roof story, or if we keep them at Granny Roof's, then keep the focus on them driving the story as brothers who find themselves suddenly in charge of the other freaks while maybe struggling with a more powerful evil freak trying to claim the group for himself, 
Like little Hal returning from being banished after hearing of his mother's demise. I would have much rather seen that and I just pulled that out of my bony ass. Again, as with some sequels, we do have some flashbacks if you want to count that as pissing time. The first five minutes is just the ending of the last movie, followed by part two's opening credit sequence that's recycled. And Bilal has a flashback to the doctors that cut him off Dwight in the first movie that sends him to a rage against the doctor helping birth his child. Hey, at least we don't have any bogus scares to annoy us. As always, can you guess what the sweet parts of this third basket case was? Did you say Dwayne and Bilal? Because you'd be right. Like I already mentioned, this is the Granny Roof show the vast majority of the time, but they do get their moment to shine close to the end when rescuing the basket of 12, count them, 12 baby Belials. This is when the makeup department goes total Bill Plimpton cartoons on us, but help us, we love it. So many of these gags are just ridiculous and unbelievable, but it's entertaining and gets you back into the movie like nothing else. Things get more interesting when the sheriff's daughter is killed in the fight and gets them all flared up and throwing his chips in the revenge pot in exchange for the babies. Wounded in the fight, Little Hal helps Bilal dish out some cold steel violence with an erector set exosuit that more than gets the job done. Well, up to a point, but luckily Bilal has a whole litter of minions at his disposal now. In the meantime, Dwayne's place on the back burner as an incompetent screwball after his psychotic break the last movie, and its only real purpose in the story is to cause trouble for the freaks, which Bilal cleans up in the end. I know he's already had two movies, but they didn't need to dismiss him as much as they did to where he could so easily have been replaced by any character and still have the same story. For being my least favorite in the trilogy, this almost family-friendly film stacks up 10 bodies, the most in the series. But don't think it's one after another throughout the film. The first kill doesn't happen until nearly an hour in, and a whopping handful happens all at once in Bilal's police station massacre, which also claims the life of one bundle of baby Bilal Joy. As much as Hen and Lauder teases us with some raunchy sheriff daughter action in the prison, we never do see the Southern Bell's talent beyond getting off on messing with the inmates. He makes up for it though with some dream sequences where Bilal escapes from the drudgery of being a dad and husband to what looks to be a horribly annoying family he never expected to have. Billy, let's look at the ingredients of this fail of a basket case film and see how it rates. <laughs> Three out of five. Decent, but a big fall from the successes of the first film. This oddball family adventure for the Munsters works for a Granny Roof spinoff, but should have never followed up a basket case as a sequel. I'd recommend you skip an hour into the movie to see the best parts, you know, the parts with the star of the series, and just forget about the rest, but what do I know? I like Killers Man of Movies! Overall, the Basket Case trilogy is a great collection of alternative monster mayhem, dishing out buckets of gore, boobs, and monsters to satisfy any horror fan. But as we pointed out, the dark and gritty nature that made the first one so great does peter out through the sequels, ending on a pretty lackluster note with what felt more like a Granny Reef spinoff by the end. Frank, if you're watching this, let's be clear, we don't hate Basket Case 3 as a film, we just hate it as a Basket Case film. This movie should have really been a Granny Roof and her Mary Freaks movie all on its own, with Dwayne and Bilal making cameos. It wouldn't be the first time you've done that with them. So in closing, definitely buy the first and second Basket Case films, and just watch the last half hour of the third movie. Rex is here! It's about time. Sorry it took so long, Dead West. But I thought Malayal needed an upgrade for what sounded like a big fight. He's in there? <laughs> Forget I asked. God, get me for where are you? I always wanted to see it. <laughs> Alrighty then, everyone. Please make your way to Center Ring for the night's main Halloween powwow event. It's a one time act, so you better hurry up. And whoever is driving the douchey 97 Pro, your lights are on. Damn it, we need to get going while the going's good. Lock and load, everybody. How's the ship looking, boys? I calculate no signs of interference. See Bunny Bone anywhere? I've not been able to locate that miscreant. Guys, just like him to be unprofessional. You got any lovely funds to be hanging off my lens? Watch it, fertilizer breath. Hey, ladies! You make sure their heads can withstand the impact of a headboard, right? Texas bastard. Get him, Alina! <laughs> we'll have none of that. <laughs> Let's make history, boys! It's showtime! I did not hit her, it's not true, it's BS! You're tearing me apart, Lisa! Oh, hey, Mark. Oh, hey, Johnny. What's up? I have a problem with Lisa. She says that I hit her. What? I kill you, you bastard! You couldn't kill me if you tried! You're not good, you. You're just a chicken. 
Chip, 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 chip. Boils and ghouls, freaks and creeps, monsters of all ages. The howling, grubbing spirits wishes you a happy Halloween and welcomes you to the greatest show in the Crosslands. Brought to you by Scary Fun and sponsored by Clown Shoe Emporium and Funhouse. We present to you Butt Kills Big Top Halloween Blow Out. Please welcome our host, the star of the night, the horror host clown who never lets you down. He's like a turd that won't flush. But kill! Happy Halloween, Halloween Brothers Spirits! Of course, you know me as your favorite horror host of the Scary Fun Show, the almighty and ugly spiky Buzz Kill. But tonight, I will be so much more to you. My super special spectacular Halloween trick for you it is also a treat for being such supportive fans. Alright, that got us. Time to make you see things my way. No for the day. Nothing stands in my way. I have run up, got up. What the fuck? Ah! Yeah! Your mama's the cheap pair of zipper pins. Uh. No! I thought, no, not a yeah. tree falls in the woods. Does that mean it was a puny tree? Hey, you are dimmy already. We can make quick work of town. Not too easy, dude. Whoa. What? How dare you shuffle them so soon you can so easily defeat me. It, Conqueror. You big head always think brains are going to beat brutality. Head trip, dude. Watch it. Keep it up, one. We got the right one. Rick, put it below. Then here he is. He motivated. Time to end this once and for all. Buzzkill! I knew that rattled. You're taking this way too far this time, ass clown. Scram, girls. Oh, I thought you'd be back. But never was such gusto. Bravo, boner. Drop the dead subject notebook. Oh, <laughs> someone thinks they have the upper hand, do they? Well, look around you. Your gang's getting whipped, but good. You're right. As their boss, I should give them some words of encouragement. How about Hocus Pocus Maximus Instant Size? What? No! Are you not playing dirty? You really swell up when you're getting the shit beat out of you. Uh, oh, you like news up? Get out of my head! There's some lemonade you can suck on. Oh shit, bet you feel like a big stuff dude now, don't you? <laughs> Face it, boner, you can't win. As long as I have the power, then one plus one equals winner, winner, turkey man dinner. <laughs> I got your table, the bar, my show, everyone's watching, and hell, I've even got your girl. Come on in, honey pie. Mandy, what the fuck? You showed me you care more about that table than you do us. Buzzkill's attentive and empathetic. I never realized just how well we go together until now. Isn't that right? My cotton candy snickerdoodle. Oh, she always knows just what to say. Attack! Who said that? It's Frankenstein's granddaughter, Maria. And she brought a reanimated army of putrid polecats, kids. No, there! I call foul! Foul! Mariah, what are you doing? What I was born to do. Stop this now! Hold it! No! Oh! Fine, if that's how you want to play. Cheap as Pocus Alicatroma Full Moon Amira Bana. Arvertus Hocus Goody Baboomy! Deadless! What are you doing? Isn't it obvious? You've been played. You lied to me to help him? But we were finally going to point tonight! You repulse me. That's my girl. Fuck me! Bitch, where do you think you're going? We still have a date between 
the sheets. <laughs> That's it. Crawl like the worms that this battleship eats. Hey, I want this goody bird to go away. <laughs> What's the magic word? Oh, you gotta be fucking kidding me. <laughs> Billy, get away from there. It's too dangerous. <laughs> Billy! Boss kill! <laughs> No closer, Boner, or the ghost babe gets it. Now, pretty please, with powder sugar on top, throw me my notebook! I love you, Dead West. Open sesame? Uh-uh, with the magic word. Ah, oh, damn it. You may think the tide's turning in your favor, Boner, but we both know how this will end. You're gonna give me back the death subject notebook, I hit the replay this level, and you'll be nothing but compost under my feet like that loser you are. Well, that's where you're wrong, ass clown. I'm a hair-raising supernatural hurricane of horrific death. I can entertain more, shoot faster, ride harder, and drink straight up unleaded longer than any man dead or alive. I ride sharknadoes and wrestle rabbit hellhound spawn. I'm the meanest spitting host that ever reviewed horror, sci-fi, action, or splatter since the turn of the 21st century. I'm Dead West. Here, mind me, mind me, mind me. <laughs> Way to ride him, Billy. Are you okay, Mandy? I'm better now. We did it. We saved the Crosslands. Thank you all so much for freeing me from their control and rescuing the Howlin. Dead West, if there's anything I can do to repay you. Well, just one, Ray. Hun, do you mind? Oh, go ahead. I know how important it is to you. Oh, like a glove. Thanks for all the support, Screen Freaks. You're more than welcome to stick around, but I'm gonna just kick back and finally enjoy Halloween the way it should be. I'll see you later, Screen Freaks. What, Tarnations? Trauma! It's a full-on war zone! Well, looks like things are just getting started around here, Scream Freaks. I'll see you next season. Hopefully. Scream Freaks. Well, thank you kindly for watching and help yourself to more servings of Screaming Sue by visiting our site at ScreamingSue.com. You can read our weekly updates, character bios, and interviews, catch up on past episodes, browse our store, and drool over the howling hottie of the week. If you want to scream at us, just holler at ScreamingSoup at gmail.com, and don't forget to stalk us through social media conveniently linked at the top of the site. 